everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the By Word Show. Today is the day. I'm so glad you're here. You guys, I'm excited because today we've got Melissa Johnson back with us. You may remember her from episode 85 of the podcast, but today we're going to be talking about how to talk to your kids about things like self-worth and identity and body image, just continuing this conversation. And I am just so excited to dive deeper. Y'all, if you want to go back and hear more of Melissa's story, definitely go to episode 85. But for today's conversation, as we start out, first of all, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here today. Like I said, we're we're digging into this topic in the context of how we can equip our kids and have mm-hmm. these conversations with our kids. So yeah. I guess right off the bat, is there anything that you think parents should know about how to talk to our kids about these concepts of identity, self-worth, body image? Mm. You know, I think um, even before talking, I was thinking about this and I, I was just thinking about the the importance of like modeling and how, mm. uh, you know, I think that's why I, I was thinking back to our other conversation, us doing the work, our own work about like healing our relationship with food and body image. And I think also like kind of cornerstone to that is taking a deeper dive into like diet culture, just because so often mm. I think this is like the water we swim in. And so like, I had no idea I had been impacted by diet culture. To me, like diet culture was like Jenny Craig and Weight Watchers. And that (laughs) wasn't, you know, I was like, well, I don't, I don't really feel impacted by those things. Um, However, I did not know that, you know, diet culture is so much broader and bigger than that. And so I think, again, just kind of undoing, opening our eyes and gaining awareness around like the images or the messages around beauty, food, exercise, all of these things, um, gaining awareness around cultural messages so that we can kind of tease apart, like what is culture? And then what is actually going to be life-giving for me as a human and as a parent, um, knowing then like how I speak about my body, how I speak about myself is going to then, you know, be what I'm modeling for the next generation and for my, my kids. And then, you know, creating a culture of, um, you know, self, self acceptance and, uh, when when it comes to these these topics, but then in terms of talking, I think I you know so I, I think it's interesting because I think we can speak directly to our kids, but then also they're picking up on so much of what we're talking about, you know, maybe with other um, other adults and or right. um, when we're making comments about food or about our bodies, and so I think that's why it's just so helpful. I'm thinking there's like this turn or this phrase of like so often um, you know parenting isn't about what's taught but what's caught. And so I think just being mindful of what, what might our children be catching from, from us and just how we are in the world and how we speak to ourselves um, and about these topics. This is a great starting point, I feel like, because it's funny, in most of these conversations we've had in this series so far, people have brought up that language about it being mm-hmm. caught more than what we just tell our kids. You know, it really mm-hmm. is so much about modeling. And I think back to my own childhood, I remember moments where my mom would make comments about mm-hmm. the way that she looked at her body. And it, you know, it made me think, huh, well, what, what about my body? Like, what, yeah. where do I line up in this? You know, yeah. how do I measure up? And it made me feel like I didn't know how to talk about it, you know? And it was yeah. something that I didn't even feel comfortable talking about with my parents, you know, it's, it's really interesting when I think back to the time, because for those who don't know my story and Melissa's as well, I struggled with an eating disorder for several years when I was young Mm -hmm. and I never told my parents, my mom actually Mm -hmm. guessed (laughs) she had a suspicion and brought it up in one of my therapy appointments and just said, Hey, I think that I think she's dealing with an eating disorder. And it just kind of came out and that I I don't think I would have brought it up if I wasn't forced to. Yeah. And so now that I'm a mom, and especially now that I have a daughter, I've been thinking so much more about, I I do need to be careful. I need to be mindful Mm -hmm. of how I am talking about my body, how I am talking about food, because I don't want to pass that Mm -hmm. on to my kids, you know? Mm -hmm. But of course, I think a lot of it is doing the work, kind of like you mentioned, doing the work for ourselves first, because Mm -hmm. it's not about just like, okay, I need to make sure I'm teaching my kids all the right things. If I'm still struggling and I don't even have it solidified in my own heart about my own identity and self-worth, you know? Mm -hmm. So in your own story, are there things that you feel were foundational for you in your Mm -hmm. healing journey that you feel like, okay, as parents, if we can get this down in our own hearts, Mm -hmm. these are the key things that we need to pass on or, or, or would be the best things to model for our kids? Such a good question. 
you know, I think, I don't know if this speaks to what you're, hopefully this is what you're, um, this will speak to your question, but I'm just even, as, as you're saying that, I think being mindful of the story I think I'm living in, like, what is the story I'm telling mm-hmm. myself? Because I think culture, like beauty culture and beauty definitions and images and, you know, what our, our bodies and our food should look like and should be is we're just inundated by that. Um, and stories about our worth, like, you know, as a woman, we are worth something if we look like X, Y, or Z. Um, right. And so often I think that story, our cultural story of what gives us worth can be central, even like just by default, again, because I think I've probably brought this up in other conversations. because I talk about this statistic a lot, but this idea that 80% of our waking hours were exposed to some kind of media. Um, mm. And wow. so obviously that is forging and forming our, our minds, our brains, our hearts, and teaching us what beauty is, what where our worth comes from. And so I think quite honestly, like throwing that narrative out and being, and this is like the first half of my book is like devoted to this, like kind of a a deep dive into how and why that falls short of our giving us our souls well, like making our souls well. Um, If we're following that narrative about our worth and about beauty, we're going to end up like just dry at at best i think mm. you know i think i got to the point where yeah i mean in a lot of ways i was um i mean kind of walking walking a road of of toward uh, de- i'm about to say death but like in, in various ways i mean if i kept going down that road i mean quite literally that could be true um however i think instead it's like throwing out opening our eyes to the story we're living in when it comes to cultural definitions of beauty and worth throwing that out when we see like how unhelpful it is and how it does not bring life and then opening our eyes to like, okay, well, what is the story that, that God invites me to live in? Like, what is like, when we think about truth, like what is the true story we're living in? And in that story, like, why do I have worth and how do I have worth and what does God say about my worth? And, you know, I think sometimes that we can speak so many like Christianese phrases about that, Mm -hmm. but like, if we actually think about like our Side note, I just turned 40. And so I've think, been thinking a lot, like I've entered midlife. And it's so weird how I actually have been thinking a lot more about like second half of life stuff. Like, what do I want my life to be about? Like, wait a second, mm-hmm. I'm not going to live forever, which might sound so naive to say that. But to even think about like, so like with that, like when I think about the story I'm living in, like, what do I actually believe about reality, about truth, about eternality? Like, is there eternal life? And I... I want to live more and more into that narrative and also have my values, my thought life, all of it be from more of that um, eternal perspective, if that makes sense. And so I think kind of thinking about the story we're living in and the resulting messages around worth and identity. That's really good. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think it's easy for us. I mean, without even having the kids in the equation, like as individuals, it's so easy to get caught up in the media, get caught up in the messages because it's everywhere we turn. It's all day long, every day. Like there's always an opportunity to get sucked into the trap and start spiraling, you know? Yeah. But it's so, it's just so important. I feel for us to keep that eternal perspective Mm. because they're, gosh, I catch myself sometimes and I'm like, why did I just spend a whole day or like this whole, you know, however long period of time, just stressing about mm-hmm. how I look, mm-hmm. what I weigh, what mm-hmm. I'm eating. When at the end of my life, I doubt that's what I'm going to be stressing about. Like when I look mm-hmm. back on my life, even now, when I, when I look at the sweetest moments in my life, none of them have anything to do with how I look, what mm-hmm. I weigh, what I was wearing, you know? And so it's so easy though, to forget that to forget what really matters. Although, you know, it is important to care about our bodies and taking care of our bodies. It's like, I don't know. It's like this dance between like, how do I care about my body without it becoming what measures my worth and my identity? Can you speak to that? Is there anything that you would say, like, how do we find a balance there where we do care about our bodies, but we don't become consumed with appearance and all of that? I was actually just talking to like this, I don't know what he would be called, like a He's actually like a, a fitness trainer, but he talks on, um, he has like a, a larger social media platform and talks about like kind of some of the nonsense in the wellness industry. And so um, I, I love what you said there too, because I think that that's the key of like 
how are we mindful of how we are, um, you know, things like nutrition and movement, but then also not being consumed by it. I think that that's the, that's the key. And I think oftentimes in our culture, especially, um, in like, you know, if we are consuming a lot of like wellness related media or social media, if we think about like the scales can be tipped so easily in, um, becoming consumed with that kind of, uh, material. Right. And I, I also, what I've seen is that actually like when we nourish our bodies well and move our bodies with joy in ways that, that bring us joy, I feel like it becomes kind of a, um, just kind of a support for our life and not like the entirety of, of our world. Cause I think the with yeah. wellness culture that can happen so easily. And so it's almost like in a way it kind of goes into the background and becomes like a the support that supports us in the good and beautiful work that we're doing in the world versus like the, like it, the thing in our life, like the main thing in our life. And so like in that conversation with a personal trainer, and I don't even know if this percentage is right, but I feel like we were, I was just talking about like, oh, if there was like a, um, if we thought about like a, a pie chart or something and maybe in more like wellness circles or in that industry, oftentimes maybe we're, we're made to think that like 90% of our life is, you know, making sure we're eating in a certain way or exercising in a certain way. And then, you know, 10% of life is like the other things, but I actually feel like it should be like flip-flopped, like 10% of our life could be thinking about like, or, and may, I don't even, I don't even know if this is, I'm just like spitballing here. I don't know if this is the exact <laughs> percentages or anything, but like, you know, 10% of life is maybe, um, moving our bodies and just kind of putting that much energy toward like nutrient rich foods or, you know, kind of nourishing ourselves well and those we love. But the whole reason that we're doing that is in service of the other 90% of our life to have energy um, mm. to, you know, serve others well or do the work that we're being invited to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that sounds super accurate because, I mean, what we eat and how we look is such a small, small piece of our mm. existence mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and our purpose even. Yeah. But it's so easy to get caught up in the tiny pieces of that. And yeah. it really does detract from everything else we've got going on over here, all of our potential, all of the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the intentional ways that God designed us. And, you know, it's interesting because I feel like body image is the mm -hmm. main character in this conversation. Yeah. But yeah. obviously there's so much beneath it that mm -hmm. is like root cause for all of those issues. Yeah. And so I'm curious maybe in your experience in therapy or working with other people, of course, body image issues, eating disorders, things like that come up a lot. Mm -hmm. But what would you say are the main things, if it's self-worth identity or something else underneath that, that really needs to be addressed as the foundation that, that we can just be mindful of as far as like talking to our kids mm -hmm. or being aware of things to watch for or talk about, if that makes sense? Yeah, that is such a good question. And I think, yeah, things to talk about with our kids. Yeah, to kind of almost like for protective layers, I guess, mm -hmm. for body image. Yeah. Yeah, like on the yeah. proactive side, if possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, because it's interesting because I think, you know, body image issues can arise for a variety of reasons. But yeah, I think uh, a couple of things are coming to mind. The first thing I'm thinking about is just conveying worth to our to our kids mm -hmm. or the kids in our life, even if we, you know, if we aren't a parent. You know, I just, I think about, um, we're, we're studying at our church, this idea of um, perichoresis. And that's just a fancy word of saying like the love that is shared in the Trinity, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, like how that actually pours out into God's relationship with humanity. And so mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like, God's love pours forth into our heart. And then we pour that into those, uh, you know, in the lives around us. And so I think that way, I think our love for our kids and our love for others is just reflective of this higher love. Um, and, you know, I've, I've sadly seen a lot of examples where, um, you know, maybe kids haven't experienced that like hands-on love from a parent. And in some cases it can be hard then if someone hasn't experienced earthly love to imagine a heavenly father. And so, yeah. you know, I think one thing which I'm imagining, um, a lot of parents are already doing. So I think sometimes in these conversations, it can be like, oh my goodness, like what are the, you know, 10 steps I can take? Um, <laughs> but really like 
showing up for your kids, like letting them know that they are worthy of your time, of your attention. And I'm even thinking about like social or, you know, like um, technology here, like, you know, maybe spending un distracted time with your kids. Like when you talk to them, getting down at eye level, um, having that secure attachment with your children, like, you know, being attentive to their, uh, you know, um, emotional, being emotionally attuned to, um, to them and basically like showing love, the love of God, um, in your human way. And, and I think that oftentimes, you know, I think Thank, literally thank God, we are given the biology around that, like as um, as moms um, for attachment and things like that, which is really beautiful. But I think again, so just kind of showing up, um, embodying love to our kids, and embodying. I think that that speaks worth to them. And I think um, you know, I think so many. I, I love words. I'm like a huge fan of words, and I think that so often that like attachment with our with our kids um, and the kids in our lives that that actually speaks love in, in a more embodied way. You know, I think with that too, like listening to our, our kids, like having conversations with them and um, helping them grow into the people God has created them to be. And I listened to this conversation, I think it was with John o- O'Donohue. He was just saying like the mystery of uh, raising kids and just how amazing it is that each child is this unique creation uh, from God and these mysterious and wonderful nuances of each new human life. And so like for him, it was like engaging with our kids in this way of like them being like this unique mystery and beautiful gift from God. Um, And I think kids feel that. Like if you really are in awe of like the miracle of their life and the miracle of who they are in the world, I think um, that's a way to embody love. Mm. And then the other thing I think we can do is practice and model embodiment. So it depends on the age of your kids. You know, I think oftentimes this kind of goes back to like social media use and just kind of like, I guess, like just general living in the world with kids. And the term embodiment just means basically living in our bodies, because so often when we think about our bodies, we think about them from like a third party perspective. Like, so if you were to ask me to think about my body right now, I would think about my body, how it looks in a picture or on my Instagram feed. Um, but really what, what we know is, uh, it's, it's actually much more probably helpful to have this embodied experience when we notice like what it feels like to be a body or to live in my body. Mm -hmm. So like when I feel joy, like, do I experience like noticing the cues, like in my body, like does my, my heart starts beating a little bit faster or maybe my palms get a little sweaty, but like the miracle actually uh, experiencing being a body. And this might be a really odd thing to, to think about, but for me, it was kind of powerful to think that years, I don't even know like what, uh, well, for sure, like thousands of years ago or I, whenever they invented them, at some point they invented the mirror. At some point people lived as humans without knowing what they looked like. Um, I mean, maybe generally, <laughs> I don't know, like in the water reflection or something, but like we have come so far from that reality. Like we are such an image based image inundated society. And so what would it be like to like, again, kind of going back to that idea of modeling, but uh, modeling this embodied being in the world, like, and maybe even inviting our kids into that, like, oh my goodness, what does it feel like when you, when you're running in that field and like, you know, the storm's coming, like, do you feel the, do you feel that wind on your um, you know, on your skin and like, what does it smell like? And just like living in the joy of like living in a body and being a body and like your experience, like your, your life experience versus this, um, almost like disembodied judgment or, um, objectification we have of our relationship with our bodies. So I think as much like modeling that in our own experience, inviting kids to kind of be embodied in that way. Um, and then also, with that knowledge, you know, depending upon our kids' age and if they are engaging social media, maybe even pointing some of these things out. Mm, That's really good. I'm glad you brought that up because I feel like it's so different. Or, uh, you know, like my kids are little. My son's about to be five and I have a daughter who's almost one. So I feel like we're pretty early in this process. Yeah. But still, you know, I even notice in my five-year-old, he's aware of his appearance. He's yes. aware of my appearance. He'll make little comments that are just so innocent and sweet. But then I think about later down the line, my daughter being in school and, you know, what if I say something, not even realizing it, that she, that, you know, she receives it a certain way and it hurts her or, you know, like for me, my first experience with 
having someone comment on my body was when I was in second grade. So I think oh, about how yeah. young kids today yes. are, are hearing those things, you know? And so mm -hmm. I feel like we can do a great job at home or, or we can do our best to be mindful of the conversations and laying the foundation. But let's say our kids do experience something, whether it's on social media or a comment from somebody at school or something. Are there things that you think we can do to help them process that or, or even just create an environment where they feel safe talking about that with us? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good, a really good point. Like we can you know, do the best work we can in the home environment. And then, yeah, what happens when there's something <laughs> that happens outside? Mm -hmm. um, I, I love the direction you're going with that. Like being a safe and open place for your kids to, to share things, to share openly. And so I think, you know, I think that's probably something that can start just really early, probably asking your kids about their emotional experience, listening mm -hmm. with like curiosity and non-judgment. And, you know, of course there are probably going to be times, it, you know, I think it's interesting, I mean, a parenthood trying to think about like, when is it time to listen and when is it time to guide? Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just speak. I know I tend to, um, <laughs> kind of go into anxiety at times. And so sometimes I think control can feel a little bit more like, like something that I can do. Um, mm. But maybe the, the challenge might even be to like, just be a non-judgmental, curious listener at, at points, knowing that, yes, there'll be spaces and times to guide as well. Um, but kind of honing that skill, knowing that that's kind of establishing then this open space for communication um, that will likely feel really, really safe and a, and a safe place to process then throughout uh, childhood, adolescence. I actually just was listening to, um, I think it's Dr. Lisa Lamour, I think is her name. I'm like butchering names today. Gosh. <laughs> anyway, she was just saying she's like this expert in, in um, she's a, a therapist and then this like teen expert in terms of her writing. And she was just saying the importance of like so often teenagers don't want advice. They just want someone to listen. And so she said like for her, she thinks about it as like when she listens to her teenager tell a story, she thinks of herself as like um, the teenager is like the writer of the story and she's the editor. So like the teen will tell the story and her job is simply to give the headline, like feed it back. Like, okay, mm. it sounds like blank. And then the teenager feels heard. Um, and so I think, I think, yeah, being an open space for those conversations, if, if, and when something hurtful happens and also though, I, I do think the home environment that we have established and the basis of your child knows their true worth, their true identity because of how you've loved them and how you've treated them and what you've taught them about their true identity and, and God and who he's created them to be. I think that that is such a sturdy and firm foundation that yes, I, I wish they would always only have those messages. <laughs> However, um, when those other messages come in, there is something firm and um, grounding there as well. That's so good. Yeah. Cause I, I think sometimes like, Oh, I, I want to protect my kids yes. from all yes. of that. Like I, I get so nervous about my daughter ever experiencing the things that I felt mm -hmm. or struggled with when I was young. And at the end of the day, um, she's going to be exposed to something at some point in her life. And so I think that it is hopeful at mm -hmm. least for us as parents to know, you know, whatever is normal, that whole modeling idea, right? Like yeah. whatever is normal in our home, is hopefully what will become normal for them and they will have that foundation. I'm curious though to know if we notice that our kids are yeah. acting in a way where it seems like they're looking for validation or worth from outside sources that are not really benefiting them. Are there things we can do to yeah. kind of help them come back to truth? Yeah. And it's such a, such a process. So like, I think my first thing, my first thing would be like, don't panic. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, identity, like we think about like, um, development, like identity. I mean, yeah, I think identity formation, like the really formative years are, are later where I feel like there's just a lot of integrative work that comes together. You know, I think it's like, I'm trying to remember the exact ages, but somewhere like in, in late teens, early adulthood where that identity formation, like really is like solidifying, but obviously mm -hmm. there are like streams of, um, I, I imagine that that's like an integration of, um, a lot of things they've learned throughout life. So I think not that it doesn't matter earlier on, but just there's so many ups and downs through through development and through life stage, lifespan, just continuing to to stand firm and solid and um, speaking the, the 
truth, as you know, of the truth over them about how loved they are, who God has created them to be, and you know, all the things that you know to be true. Um, and, you know, anytime that that can be reinforced in community spaces, whether that's, um, I don't know, like the, the preschool they go to, or maybe some of the books you're reading. Um, and not that it has to be like 100%, like, I think that there's, um, truth and goodness in all kinds of like, even, you know, non-Christian sources and things like that. But I, I do think to have like a steady stream of truth, you know, from a, a more biblical perspective, you know, kind of continually throughout life, I think is, is very important that that truth continually being fed to them i think on various levels is is really important and helpful yeah i think just continuing to to speak into their lives in those ways but then also i, I was also thinking of um i i'm such a proponent for therapy as well mm-hmm. and so i think the more the more i i just really think also just like this communal nature of raising kids in terms of pulling in resources as much as possible. I kind of shirk away from the American independence idea. And like, this is, <laughs> I feel like this is like communal. Like if, as much as you can get in like trusted family members or friends or therapists and, you know, cause may, maybe there's something going on for them that's kind of getting in the way, whether it's, you know, um, a mental health issue or a family system issue um, that maybe they're getting stuck on that they're struggling with. And so I think um, that's where I think therapy can be a really, really helpful use uh, resource as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I feel like for me, as I mentioned previously, I never would have I never would have talked to my parents probably if I wasn't in therapy and had someone else, you know, like being a mediator between me and my parents. So yeah, cannot thank therapists enough for the work that they do, like looking back. Cause I feel like there were moments my parents didn't know what to do. I mean, they yeah. did the best that they could. My parents left me. I had great parents through that process and I just am so grateful for the community we had around us, you know, other parents who noticed things maybe that my parents mm-hmm. didn't see or teachers that noticed, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it really does take a group effort. Yes, <laughs> so yeah. having other people call out those things, I agree. I think that is so crucial. Mm, yeah. I'm so glad that you had a positive experience because as you, yeah, I'm such a, I just think therapy is so helpful in so many different ways. So I'm glad that that's how you experienced it as well. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I know there's so much to this and I, there's just so much more where this came from. I'm glad you mentioned your book as well, because for the parents listening, that is also an incredible resource. Mm -hmm. But before we go, is there anything else you want to leave the moms with who are listening, any tools in their tool belts or any encouragement before we go? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. You know, I just, something that I know I've been thinking about a lot is, um, you know, I know we started off our earlier in our conversation, we talked about this idea of like, what story are you living in? And I think one thing that I think can be just helpful in life in the parenting journey, um, in all of it is kind of grounding in that, um, like, like the love and the grace of God as much as possible. And I know for me, sometimes doing that in, in an embodied way can be super helpful. Like maybe even as a morning practice, um, just to kind of start off, off the day in a way that reminds us of, that lar- larger story we're a part of, but also the larger love that we're connected to and like mm-hmm. are created in, um, knowing that like God's love is like literally like the air we breathe. And, um, and so I think that grounding in that can just really be helpful when we're trying to remember the narrative we're living in. I think that's so instrumental in helping us model something different than what the world is giving us. Absolutely. That's so good. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing more of your wisdom. I feel like there's just so many things, so many pieces of this, but you spoke, yeah. you spoke to it in such a way where it was like very simplified and it takes the pressure off of us as parents, because mm-hmm. I feel like a theme for me, at least as I've been having these conversations in these series is okay. I can take a breath because it's not up to me to have it all figured out, but how can I shepherd them and steward this time with them well? And Mm -hmm. I just think you spoke to that so beautifully, Melissa. So thank you so much for being Mm -hmm. here. Will you tell everybody where they can get your book and get connected and find more resources? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. So my book is called Soul Deep Beauty, Fighting for Our True Worth in a World Demanding Flawless. And you can basically get it, I think, wherever books are sold. Um, Yeah, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, 
where else you can find me. My podcast is called Impossible Beauty. So our website is impossible-beauty.com and the podcast is on most major platforms. On the podcast, we seek to redefine beauty as the life of God at work in us and among us versus unhelpful cultural narratives. Um, Because I think that that is a process. And so I think the podcast can be really instrumental and helpful in that. So those are the major places. Oh, and then at Melissa.Louise Johnson and at impossible.beauty on Instagram. And then on Facebook, it's, I think it's like impossible beauty blog and podcast um, page on Facebook. I always, <laughs> it's kind of long. So those are the places. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, perfect. I'll make sure everything is linked for you guys. Go get a copy of her book and check out the podcast. There's seriously just so, so, so many more resources like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and thank you, Melissa, again, for being here. I'm just so grateful for you mm-hmm. and the work you do to help so many women heal mm-hmm. and then be able to pass it on to our kids. Mm, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to tune in to another episode of the ByWord Show. I love having you here and your support truly means the world to me. If you enjoyed this episode, would you leave a quick review? It really helps our community grow and reach more women. If you want more, you can shop my books, Waking Up, Living Open, and Love Is on Amazon. And be sure to sign up for my email list so you always get the latest news. I can't wait to chat again soon, but in the meantime, be sure to come hang out with me on social media and remember, I'm cheering you on.